Just think of all the words that start with M. Producer Steve here. My favorite M's are Mondays, Mock Draft, Metal. <laughs> you already know. We put those three things together here at the Sleepwire Show, and we get Metal Mock Monday. That's right. Metal Mock Monday returns to the airwaves April 29th at 7 p.m. That's a Monday, by the way. In case you don't know what it is, let me explain. Metal Mock Monday is a live podcast show where we do mock drafting for three hours. We play heavy metal in the background, and uh, we basically just talk about football. If you love mock drafting, it's sometimes hard to fill a mock draft, especially uh, when it's early in the season like this. But I guarantee we will fill usually three to four at a time. We'll probably run 12 to 15 total mock drafts throughout the show. So we'll get you into one, and it will go. Again, the big return of Metal Mock Monday is Monday, April 29th at 7 p.m. If you want to listen live, here's the best way to find us. Go to the Sleeper app. Join the Sleeper Wire channel. Go to Facebook groups. Join the Sleeper Wire Fantasy Football Club or on Twitter, follow at Sleeper Wire Show. Put it on your calendar right now. The big return of Metal Mock Monday, April 29th, 7 p.m., only on the Sleeper Wire Show. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Sleeper Wire Show. I'm your guest host today, Brad Genius. I have a guest coming up by the name of Eric Crocker, former player. Now he does a whole bunch of things. We're going to get to him in a little bit. All I want to say is it is draft season, baby. The prospects are getting ready to find their new homes. They're going to find where they need to go, what they need to do, who they need to beat, because you know that's all they're thinking about is who's going to be in front of them. They want to be the top dog. Gosh, this is... This is insane. I'm going to touch on a little bit of news. That really ain't my thing. But there's some things that need to be said. Like the Cardinals still don't know who they're picking number one. Yeah, right. Uh, Josh Gordon signed to the Patriots, re-signed to them. So hope things work out for him with the talent. I'm not invested in Josh Gordon in any way just because I've lost hope. And it's sad to see. It's a very, very sad thing. Ben Roethlisberger got re-signed. I'm not saying he, he deserves it or anything. He's getting kind of old up there. They kind of need to bring in a new guy there, in my opinion, to learn from him, unless they think Mason Rudolph is that guy. But they re-signed him, and now they have him. He's 37 years old. I think they re-signed him until he's like 39 or 40, which is it's it's crazy. It's It's just crazy. All these quarterbacks are playing forever, their whole lives in the NFL. This is insane. I don't know where Josh Rosen's going to go. Cardinals saying that they love him. I don't know where he's going to go. But my guess right now, and I'm going to talk about this with my guests coming up, I think Rosen becomes a Miami Dolphin. That's That's my opinion just from who I've talked to around the league and what I've seen, what I've heard. That's my opinion. The GOAT, Marshawn Lynch, has finally retired for the third time, I think. But just read, like, at two minutes ago that his mom doesn't think that he's done with football. So we'll see. Who knows? Who knows? Enough of the news and notes. I'm tired of – I don't even want to bring up Tyreek Hill, Nelson Aguilar, (laughs) Dwayne Haskins. I don't want to bring up any news about all these NFL players because we got a great show planned And I have a great guest right here. I'm going to bring him in and introduce him from this one question. Mr. Eric Crocker, who is going number one overall? Uh, Nick Bosa. Nick Bosa. Okay, look, I love it. I love it. I love it. That's who who should, right? I mean, you, you don't invest. You could get value on a quarterback later in the draft, as we've seen throughout the years. Nick Bosa is like, I mean, would you take J.J. Watt or would you take a guy like, uh, I don't know, Mitch Trubisky, number one? You're going to pick J.J. Watt because he's a Hall of Famer. Nick Bosa looks like he's going to be a Hall of Famer. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. But anyways, 
that was the voice of Mr. Eric Crocker. Give the audience a little explanation of who you are, what you've done, what you currently do. Just tell them who is Eric Crocker, who is Croc Time, who is this. Oh man, just tell them who you are. <laughs> All right, so um, you know, so you know, former uh, NFL AFL player, I had a much more of a career in the AFL than the NFL, but I had a brief stint with the New York Jets in 2013. So that you know, obviously that was a great experience um, being there throughout all of off-season OTAs, uh, mini camps, uh, training camp, you know, all of that stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, I had all that that you know experience playing there. Um, I actually was the number one overall pick in the arena draft in uh, 2014. So that was something pretty cool, right? And um, since then, you know, I played a few more years. Uh, I got into you know, I stopped playing. My, my kids started getting a little bit older. I stopped wanting to be away from home. Uh, so I got into, you know, coaching, training athletes, training defensive backs. Uh, that was something at that time I didn't see a lot of people doing. So um, actually, I didn't see anybody really doing it. <laughs> so at least not on social media. So I started training defensive backs. Um, I built that up. Now, I, you know, I train athletes. And, and then I just, um, from my experience playing football, training athletes, stuff like that, I started breaking down uh, DB's technique on, on Twitter. So this is probably about two years ago um, when you weren't really seeing a lot of that. Uh, I, I would just post videos of, of guys, um, you know, hey, this is good technique or this is bad technique. And, and I would record it and just put it on on Twitter. And uh, people kind of gravitated to that. And I mean, my following just started growing and people started asking me to do different writing things. So I started writing for like uh, uh, fourth and nine. It's more of a 49ers uh, podcast. Um I did some stuff with my guys from Nothing But Niners. I'm a 49er fan, so um, I started getting to that. And then one thing led to another. Uh, you know, I finally have my own podcast called the Press Coverage Podcast, where I talk about wide receivers and defensive back specifically. And, um, man, I mean, anybody that follows me, you know, I just talk about football all day. All day. I love it. Football's my life. My wife hates it. Uh, she doesn't hate it, but she kind of picks at me sometimes and says, like, man, Eric, you, you, you love you love football more than you love your family, you know? And it's just, you know, it's just a, like a, a passion of mine. It's been like that since I was a little kid. So, um, yeah, man, I mean, you want to know about me. I mean, it's, it's just football. Like, that's me. Football and family, pretty much. I mean, you said it perfectly. I mean, you forgot to mention you're an, an Arena Bowl champion, too. That, I that's know, pretty, yeah. Like, so, that's so, pretty uh, I mean, come on. <laughs> I was hurt. I was hurt. So I got hurt. I fractured my ankle week 13 of the season. I started every game. I fractured my ankle week 13. And um, so I didn't get to play in the in the, in the the playoffs or championship game. And so I am an Arena Bowl champion, but I kind of put an asterisk next to it because I still feel like, you know, I should have been, I should have been playing. I should have been on that field at that time. And I wasn't. Um, but, you know, we still won. You know, still got the trophy and everything. So, yeah, I am a, I am a, tro- a, a Arena Bowl champion, but, you know, there's a little asterisk next to that. And, I mean, you you That was the first time I ever missed a game in my life. Like, from Pop Warner, high school, college, never missed a game due to injury. Pros, never missed a game until I fractured my ankle in, in 2015. Uh, that's, and that's insane. I mean, you... You could kind of see how good of a career you had in the AFL with, you know, 16 career interceptions, four forced fumbles. Just bringing up a few of your stats, and I mean, you, you had 160 tackles in two years, three years. I mean, that's that's great. You know, that's like that's some some players don't even have that in a whole career. Right, and I so. and I kind of like re- retired like prematurely. Um, I definitely could have kept playing. I think I was like 27, 28 when I stopped playing. I, I could have kept going, but my son, you know, I had my son at a young age, so he, he was getting older. And I, I think uh, one thing that people kind of lose sight of, like, you know, when you're playing sports and doing, especially doing what I did with, you know, going off to college, you know, we talked about my college, but in Arkansas, then playing pro and all that, like, I, I was away from home that whole time and, you know, losing out on a lot of time with my son. And it got to a point where it was like, you know what, like, I, I need to be there for him. And I love football, but let me just start figuring out what's going to be next for me. And, you know, the money was, was solid, you know, in the AFL. But, 
to me, it was just like, you know, it, it was more important for me to be around my family and just kind of figure out what was going to be next. So, um, right, right. And that's so, yeah, I, I probably should still be playing. I think about it every day. Like, man, I should still be playing. I see a lot of my boys still playing. Uh, my coaches hit me up, like, hey, Croc, like, are you in shape? Like, we want you out here. And I was like, nah, like, you know, I'm done. I'm done. So, um, I still have gotten those phone calls to have those type of opportunities, but nah, I'm done. <laughs> and I mean, that's, you did it the right way. You know, you gotta, you really have to make your mark and make your money while you're young and then, you know, let your, go back to your family, go back to your roots and, you know, show other people, look, this is what I did. I'm doing it the right way. I'm back with my family so they can enjoy the fruits of my labor. They can right. enjoy what I've done. So, I mean, look, I'm all to it. I'm all for you. That's, you did it right in my book. Oh, so now you. we're going to talk about the San Francisco 49ers. <laughs> yeah, that's my squad. So I came across a recent picture. I don't know if it'll sound familiar to you, but, uh, Quinnen Williams at two, Debo Samuels at 36. Do you you see where I'm going with this? <laughs> yeah, my little mock I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, let's let's talk about it. Uh, pick two. Let's see if it changed or anything in your mind. Who you got going number two overall to the San Francisco 49ers? I, I think if, if, you know, going off of what I feel like they are going to do, if, if Bosa is there, I think he's the, the answer. I think that's who they're going to take. Who I would take is Quentin Williams, just because I think that his ceiling for who he is is it, just he's just the he's the best defense defender in the draft, in, in my opinion. He's dominant, especially from that interior where he's at three tech, one tech, you know, zero tech. Like it doesn't matter, if, you know, nose tackle, three tech, whatever. He he's just dominant. He's dominant, you know, against the run. He's dominant against the pass. Um, I want to say like eight sacks last year. I mean, a lot of them he's just bullying people around in the interior. So me, I'm looking at like if 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 you put him next to Buckner, you know, what's that gonna do for Buckner who pretty much played with nobody next to him and still had 12, 13 sacks last year? So, you know, that that type of person next to Buckner, as well as, you know, they just added D uh D Ford. So, you know, to me that that's just like, okay, I got my edge rush, I got my guy screaming off the edge. You know, now I have, you know, Williams who, you know, it, you know, extremely high ceiling. I mean, dude's over 300 pounds around a 4840. Like, that's insane. So he has insane athleticism. You put that next to Buckner. You can go and get a veteran edge rusher like maybe Ezekiel Ansa, who's still out there. Um, or, you know, like in my mock draft in the third round, I took Polite, who, you know, has some character concerns and how much does he love football. He came into the combine super out of shape. Uh, but I know one thing about Polite. When he's on that field, he's screaming off that edge. So, uh, Quentin Williams, that that would be my pick at two, just because the, the ceiling is too high. And, and I will say this about Bosa, um, I don't think that he's his ceiling is extremely high, like maybe a, a Quentin Williams. I do think that he is a solid player, and I think his floor is extremely high. So there might be somebody else like Brian Burns, who if somebody was to say, tell me like, hey, Brian Burns ended up being a 15 sack a year guy and Bosa is only 11 or 10 or 11 sack a year. I, I, I could see that, but I think no matter what Bosa is a 10 sack guy, that's like his floor. That might be his ceiling, but he's going to be around 10 sacks where Burns, he can be a 15 sack a year guy, but he might be a three sack a year guy as well. You know what I'm saying? So, right, um, right, right. So I, I could see Bosa, but yeah, Quentin Williams, that's who I would take just too freaky, too freaky at, at, at that size. He's a savage. That's what it comes yeah. down to. He plays mean, you know, and that's what you want on the defensive line. You want somebody who's mean, who, you know, like the old Raiders back then, who just throw your face in the ground and sag the quarterback and kind of take a nap on him for a few seconds, you know, <laughs> keep him on the ground, let him know who's boss. That's what Quentin William does. And he's young. He's, I think, 20 years old. This guy is a great guy off the field. His character is great. He's an instant need fit for San Francisco. I, I agree. That should be the pick, and that better be who they pick if they really, really, really want to get in that late half of the draft, 
those last four picks of the draft because you know they want to reach those playoffs again. They want to do right. big things. Right. Another guy I like, you mentioned Polite, so being the third guy off in your in your mock, I like Montez Sweat. And now he does have the heart condition and stuff like that. But I think just like Brian Burns, his upside is tremendous. They're saying Montez Sweat, you know, he the number one thing in his life is football. He likes that more than breathing, likes that more than money. That's the number one thing. So I like him. But I also want to touch on your mock draft. You have two receivers going. Right. The receiving core of the San Francisco 49ers is Dante Pettis, Kendrick Bourne, Richie James, Trent Taylor, a few other guys you have. You know, Pierre Garçon is out the door. Yeah, but you yeah, have Marquise a, Goodwin still. Marquise Goodwin. True, true, true. I forgot to name him. But you have them taking Debo, Mr. Debo Samuels, at the fourth pick in the second round. Now, look, I love this pick. I actually did a seven-round mock draft, my final mock before the NFL draft, and Debo is on top of the second round. I think he might have even gone to the San Francisco 49ers. I think it's a perfect pick. I really do, and I think he fits – a huge need for them. He actually did go to the San Francisco 49ers. That's weird, wow. right? And yeah, wow. my mock, yeah, that's that's great minds think alike here. So I'm 100% with this pick. The pick I don't understand is that pick 104. You have Miles Boykin going there. Explain right. to me if this is still the pick for you or if you think they should go another route, kind of a um, maybe a J.J. or Sega Whiteside possibly. Right. So So now – Whiteside would have been the guy. So you know, in that in that mock, he was on the board with the uh, the Forty Nine ers third round pick, where I took Polite. But if Polite was gone, then Whiteside would have been the pick. No matter what, I was taking two receivers. And, and the reason for that is because if you look at the Forty Nine ers receiving court right now, there's just names. And who's going to be there long term? You know, the only one that's kind of pegged to be there long term is probably Pettis. You know, outside of that, Goodwin. He might be there another year. Maybe he had a really good first year with the Niners, and then last year he had 27 catches. Um, he's injured a lot, you know, like just little things that he's nicked up and misses a lot of time. Um, so you can't really count on him. Yeah, Trent Taylor, he's just like this little slow slot. He knows how to create separation. He knows how to get the best. Like he can be a high-volume catch guy, but he's somebody that you can definitely do without, especially if you add two receivers. And then you have Kendrick Bourne, who I think is a good number four receiver. Right, so Kendrick Bourne's your fourth receiver. That's fine. If somebody goes down, he can fill in. That's cool. But he's not somebody that you probably are going to bank on being there long term or build around. So the way I was looking at it was, I need to find guys who are going to be here long term. And oh, there's a train behind me. But um, I need to build long term. And if I'm going to build long term, it starts in this draft. So I took Debo Samuel, who I think has. I know people don't really look at shorter receivers as being a wide receiver one. I don't know why. You would think that that kind of narrative is going out the window with guys like Jarvis Landry, uh, Odell Beckham, Antonio Brown. Um, but people look at size and it's like, oh, well, he's only 5'11", 6 foot. He can't be a number one. And it's like, that's not true. Look at the skill set. Debo plays extremely big. He, he plays big. He knows how to go up, high point balls. He does all that. He's goal line freak. And I think sometimes when people think goal line receiver, they think it's just somebody that you can just throw a fade up to and he catches it every time. It's like, no, it's just somebody that knows how to score in the red zone, and that's that's Debo. Um, he works all areas of the field better than anybody, if you ask me. Like, as far as you can give him the ball in a jet sweep, you see him uh, catching slants and running 70 yards. He scored on the first play against Kentucky last year, uh, took it 70 yards a, a slant. I, I mean, he does those type of things. He works digs comebacks like he can work all air like outside receiver slot you know z x it, it, like it doesn't matter he's just a really good talented football player he's extremely tough great run after the catch so that's the guy that i really like there and then when you talk you talked about boinkin and to me I, I think some people might think that boinkin might go higher right just because you know of how well he tested he's 6'4 220 he ran low 44s vertical jump you know over 40 inches his three cone was extremely high Right. All those good things. But to me, when I watched the film, I, I didn't see him play with that type of athleticism. You know, you'd see it here and there, but it wasn't something that was consistent. Now, somebody that watches just highlights, they might look at it and be like, man, he's a beast. But when you watch him consistently play, it's like, uh, 
Too many times I think it's too easy for defensive backs to press him, get their hands in his chest. Uh, he doesn't create separation uh, downfield. Often everything is pretty much contested compared to, like, if you watch Debo and you see him open a lot downfield. I, I didn't see that with Boykin, who had that type of physical, um, you know, testing, right? So there were a lot of things. To, to me, it looked like he was just, like, raw, but it looked like he had the ability be, to be really good, just not there yet. So I think he's, he's somebody that's going to be there late third round, maybe fourth round, but he has a lot of things that he can that you can build on and add to what the 49ers have, and you would have a really good core if you can get him going and have Debo, Pettis, and, of course, George Kittle. Excellent explanation. <laughs> That's exactly what I wanted, and it was great. that You made a, a great point. I mean, this is the ideal situation for the San Francisco 49ers. One thing about you brought up film. If you're out there watching highlights – and not all 22 film, you're doing it wrong. Okay, people, well, like... I, I don't have access to all 22, but I do have, you know... Well, NFL, I do, obviously, with the game pass. But college, I don't. But there's a lot that you can see, even just by watching the, the YouTube. And if you just really watch it and you know what you're looking at, you it's really... It's not hard to see what a receiver is doing well or doesn't do well. You can see all that. You know, now it's harder to kind of judge secondary, uh, the safeties. So a lot of times you don't see me talking too much about safeties, but receivers, cornerbacks, man, those things are those. You can see all that in those YouTubes, and you have access to so many different uh, films and clips and cutups. You can go through them pretty quick. So I, I love watching those things and breaking it down. Like when you watch those, you get to see exactly who a guy is, exactly who he is. The highlights, I think those highlights lie a lot. They lie. Right, right, and. That's 100% along the lines of what I was saying. On, You know, even on YouTube, you could find full games and stuff. You you kind of want to watch not just the splash plays, but you want to see how a receiver blocks. You want to see what he does. If the run's a sweep to the right and they have two receivers on the left side of the field, none on the right, and he knows all he's doing is blocking or selling on a little route, you want to see if he gives up or takes the play off. That's why I think highlights are – not the way to go, so I'm agreeing with you right there. So some of the highlights we have seen actually over the past few days have been the rumors about the NFL draft, yada, yada, yada. We've heard them all. What do you think the Giants are going to do? Do you think they're really going to draft Daniel Jones at number six? And do you think he deserves to go at number six? Or do you think they should address their other needs in this you know, spot six, which is a pretty high spot? You could go with a guy like Brian Burns. You could go with maybe a Devin White if he's there at six or a Devin Bush. Or you could go with Dwayne Haskins, who is more of a fit for that offensive scheme that they're doing in New York that they've done since Eli has been there. Uh, Eli has never been the most mobile guy. So Haskins is kind of the same quarterback in that sense where he's not as mobile. He, He is mobile, but not as much. And he does have to have a clean pocket and throw just like Eli does. So I think he is basically a younger Eli man, except a little bit more upside, of course. What do you think they should do with this pick, the New York Giants at six? Yeah, you know, they, they just need talent. And I, I thought last year they should have taken the quarterback. You had a chance to get a guy like Sam Darnold and have him be able to sit behind Eli Manning. I thought would have been the ideal situation for 100%. Sam Darnold. Um, so even now, like even seeing what Barkley is and what most people thought he was going into last draft, I still, even if, if I were able to go back and do that draft again, if I were the Giants, I still would take Sam Darnold because that was what I thought they should have done. And now look at them this year. They're back in the same situation looking for a quarterback, you know? So, um, if, if I were them, I, I think quarterback has to be a priority, but I don't know if these are the guys to do it. Uh, last year, I think they had their pick at guys that can really be a guy. After after uh, Kyler Murray, I'm not so sure, you know. And, and even with Haskins, I'm I'm not 100% sold on them. I think a lot of what they asked him to do was simple. I think he had a lot of like when you look at his numbers, you see like 50 touchdown passes. I think a lot of it's inflated with him just throwing like a little two yard crosser to Campbell and him running 50 yards to the end zone. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of those in there that kind of inflated his stats. Uh, I, I didn't think that 
you know, I think if you if you just pick plays here and there, you can put together a great highlight film of him. But I thought when I watched his games, I, I didn't think he was that – he didn't have that consistency. That, that's just in my opinion. I, it doesn't look like Baker Mayfield's film, right? And this is the guy that had the best athletes on the field. This is the guy that had a really good offensive line, you know, and I still didn't see that type of consistency out of him that I would have liked to see. see. So um, it, it's tough, man, like – but. When you look at their team overall, like they just need talent. They've lost a lot of guys. They, you know, they're secondary. They just lost uh, Collins. They, they don't have, uh, you know, Dominique Rogers, Kamardi. Somebody, you know, they have uh, uh, Jack Rabbit. Uh, 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 why can't I think of his name? Number twenty, the corner. Eli. No, Jenkins. Yeah, Jenkins. Jenkins. So you have Janoris Jenkins, but now he's getting older. Now, right? He's not playing with that same fire that he played with when he first got to New York uh, from the Rams. So. You know, they, they're depleted of talent. They let go of Ogletree. Um, he wasn't great, but he was just some talent, some more talent that they lost. So I, I'm really confused with what they're doing or what they're going to do or how they're building this process. That's probably why Odell Beckham was so frustrated, right? Um, I think at that point, I just have to take the bet, the highest player on my board, regardless of what position that guy is at. And you have another pick at 17. I'd be more willing to take a quarterback there. or Maybe trade 17 for Rosen. I would take Rosen over any quarterback probably outside of Kyler Murray in this draft. So um, at, at six, I probably would take the best player. And then at 17, I might try to move that for Rosen. Right, right. And that's, that's similar to what I would do. I would trade for Rosen. You know, you have the draft capital to do so. All for 17th overall. I think Rosen would be the number one quarterback in this draft. That's just me. Because if Kyler goes to a bad situation – What's to say whenever his rookie contract isn't over, he doesn't leave and go play baseball because that's where the money's at, you know, and he he plays five years in the MLB and he's set up for life to where if he does bad with a bad team, he might not get a good contract his second go around in the NFL. So that's just my opinion on that. You hit the nail on the head. I mean, they need to get the best player on their board. I don't think that that should be Daniel Jones. If they're going to wait on a quarterback and – they really believe Eli has years left. Take this year and pick two a number one next year. Get him in New York somehow, some way. And you got a quarterback for the long term because we've seen Tua since, you know, key in on freshman year production. As a freshman, if a quarterback produces, he's usually going to be good. Sophomore, junior, senior, and then boom in the NFL. So that's my little, you know, tidbit on that. What I want to do on this this later half of the show, I want to do a mock draft of just the first round with you. So All right, let's do it. You give a pick and just say why, and I'll say, yeah, I agree, or yeah, I disagree, and then boom, next pick. So we're going to go number one. We both know it's it's Kyler Murray, right? No? Right, no. yeah, let's go with Murray. Because me and you both think that they should pick Bosa, 100%. But I don't think they do that. I think it's Kyler Murray, and I think I think Quentin Williams would be would be a good pick for them too because they're going to that three four, and I think ideally if you have Quentin Williams as a three four in, I think he'd wreak havoc there. So Quentin Williams would be a good pick, but um, for the sake of you know argument, I, I'd go with uh, Kyle, Kyler Murray. Yeah, I, I agree. I, this isn't what they should do, you know. This is what I think they're gonna do. Got it. Got it. I, I think they should take. Both, I think. I mean, that's perfect. You have him and Chandler Jones on each and end with Robert Kimdichi in the middle. I mean, come on. That's ridiculous. Quinn Williams, too. Quinn Williams is the best player in this draft, in my opinion. He's the best athlete in this draft, best talent. So then number two, you got San Francisco. We're going Joey Bosa's little brother, right? Nick Bosa. Right, Nick Bosa, yeah. That's that's it. So this is where it gets a little a little rough for me. This pick to the New York Jets at third would be Josh Allen for me. Who do you think should go third? Yeah, I mean they they've been looking for edge. Uh, you know he he fits what they want to do. I, I want to say they're they're a three four team, right? Um, so yeah, having him coming off that edge, I, I think it just it, it works. So um, and even if they're not a three four team, I think he can play more of a, a outside linebacker like you know. Um, if they run a 4-3 under, he can be more of a Sam, uh, strong side, you know, backer and, you know, still put his hand in the dirt on uh, passing downs. So, 
Yeah, he, right. he makes this a lot is, of sense to go there. This is like a uh, kind of like what Khalil Mag did at the beginning of his career in Oakland. He could play kind of that that nine tech, you know, standing up defensive end, and they could play basically, you know, a, a five down lineman almost, and have four defensive linemen and have that fifth one kind of standing up off the edge, and that could be Josh Allen. They could do a lot there with him on that defense, I think. I think right. that that's the pick to make. But then you have Oakland right after a number four. Now, what I think they're going to do is I think they're going to be stupid because that's what John Gruden does. But what they should do is take the best player in the draft, Quinn and Williams. Right, and, and, and I think that's what they will do. I know they got, like, more Hurst last year. But, uh, nah, take the best player um, on the board and really probably the best defensive player in the draft. So, yep, Quentin Williams. So now Tampa Bay. Their main need is, you know, linebacker, defensive talent, really. That's what they need. Do you think they go linebacker here, or do you think that they go another way of maybe defensive end or something of this? Yeah, um, you know, they, they, they have Gerald McCoy, but, you know, let's let's go and and figure out that interior again and get one of the freakiest uh, defensive players in this draft, and 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 that's Ed Oliver. So, yeah, I said yes. Ed Oliver there, and they still need a linebacker, but it's kind of it's not often you come, you know, you get to a guy like Ed, you get a guy like Ed Oliver at five, who really in any other draft probably would be you know a top three pick. Right, right, right. Ed Oliver. I mean, this dude. He's a freak. <laughs> you said it uh, as well as I can say it. This dude, I don't think he's that far behind Quinn Williams. There is a little gap between them, but I could see him having almost just as good as a career. He might right. not have the floor, but the ceiling is probably as high. So uh, now we go to the New York Giants. We touched on this earlier. Where do you think they go? They have – they need everything except a running back. So where do they go? <laughs> I, you know, I think uh, at this pick, I think we're going to go stay with the defensive team, and they're going to go Brian Burns out of Florida State. Brian Burns. This dude can wreak havoc. He can be – you know, if they're going to go away from the offensive additions in this first round, they need to stack up their defense because their defense looks like – I mean – you know, the joke is always there. Oh, if you put Alabama versus the Browns, do you think Alabama would win? Well, I can tell you Alabama would beat the Giants probably. <laughs> because, I mean, yeah. it's one of those situations where they just flush the talent out of New York, and they need to restock it, whether that's on defense or offense. They need to pick best player available at every position on this draft. So I agree. This is this is going perfect. Now let's get to Jacksonville. My favorite person to land in Jacksonville is Jawan Taylor, the offensive tackle. Right, and he probably would have been a good pick for the Giants as well. You know, we talk about some of the the uh, the issues that they've had on the line. But, yeah, you know, they haven't been able to protect, like, Leonard Fournette. He's been banged up a lot, uh, haven't been able to protect the quarterbacks too much. So, yeah, I think Jawan Taylor would be a good pick for, for Jacksonville. Do you think that's who they go with? You know, it's tough, but yeah, I mean, that that's what makes sense. You have the defense ready to go. Um, offensively, I could see them possibly taking a receiver, but is there a receiver that you really want to take right there, you know, this high in the draft? Maybe DK McCaff, but um, I think ideally, you know, at that spot right there, you want to take the best offensive lineman, probably the, best, the guy highest on your board, and it's probably, you know, Juwan Taylor. Glad we agree. I'm not. I'm not too big on DK Metcalf because, you know that it, it says something about AJ Brown too because he could not pass up AJ Brown at Ole Miss and a guy like DK who is that athletic and that freakish, you know, just a freak of nature. Really, to me, he should have been able to pass up AJ Brown if he's really that good. So I'm not sold on him being the first receiver taken in this draft. Personally, that would be AJ Brown for me because I think he can be an instant impact guy. Who knows, maybe A.J. Brown comes up, you know, further along in this round. We'll see. Now let's go to a team that they might need a receiver. They might not, depending on how you value Marvin Jones. The Detroit Lions. I think they ha they need a lot of positions on defense. But 
do you see them going another route or who do you see them taking at this spot? Yeah, no, I was going to go with, um, I, I probably would say edge, but with Brian Burns going, that kind of, uh, you know, hurts them a little bit. So I'll go greedy Williams. They take a corner to play opposite, uh, uh, Darius Slay. Ooh, that would be. And that's how <sighs> I'm not really high on any, uh, cor- I'm not that high on any corners in this draft, but, um, greedy has the upside to kind of, uh, you know, justify taking them that high, you know, at, at number, uh, eight. So, yep. I would say greedy pair him with Darius Slay, And, you know, I, I wanted to go edge, but there wasn't an edge that I, I would take, you know, right there. Right. And I'm, you know, I'm the same way about cornerbacks in this draft. I like Byron Murphy and DeAndre Baker a lot. I like Baker because he is one of the most instinctive corners I've ever seen. It's like he doesn't even think half the time. He just does the right thing. You know, a little bit speed issue there, but I think, I mean, that to each his own, basically. You never know with these corners in the next level because it's a whole different, you know, whole different momentum at the next level. So, Buffalo. Okay, Buffalo, I have them with Rashawn Gary, the defensive lineman out of Michigan. That's who I think. Nah, he might he might have been somebody good for uh, Detroit. I forgot about Gary. Because I don't look at Gary as – it's kind of tough. I, I guess you shouldn't look at production, pure production, especially coming out of college. Uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with traits. And you never know how they were asked, you know, how they were used, you know, at their college. Sometimes that takes away from some of the production. Um, I've heard some people say, hey, man, Chase Winovich was better than Gary. No, he's not. Gary is another one of those guys who's a physical freak. Um, For whatever reason, it didn't amount to production. But, yeah, I I think at this pick, that that might be a good spot for him. I'm with you on that. That's glad we agree there. Now, Now we get to the interesting part where we might see another quarterback go off the board, and that's the Denver Broncos. So what do you think the Denver Broncos should do here? Yeah, should they go Dwayne Haskins, Drew Locke, Daniel Jones? Who Who's your guy here? Will Greer? It, it sounds like Drew Locke is the guy. Right? I, th- I feel like they love Drew Locke. I feel like Elway, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of him, but he really does silly things like this, like – tell you who he's going to draft and then draft him. You know, it's not a surprise anymore. So I'm with you. We're going to put Drew Locke at this spot. Now pick 111, okay? We're approaching the halfway point through the draft almost. The Bengals need a linebacker. Do you think this is too early for Devin Bush? Or do you think think they go with LSU linebacker Devin White? Who do you have higher? I'm going to go with Devin White. I'm going to go with Devin White. And, I mean, they're, they're kind of similar, both uh, squatty, very athletic, explosive linebackers, um, you know. I, but I'm, I'm going to go with the LSU guy. I'm going to go with White. That's a toss-up for me. You know, I, I just think they need to pick a linebacker, especially with Vontez Burfitt going out the door to Oakland. So now you have the Green Bay Packers, and – I think this is time for Green Bay to draft a new weapon for Aaron Rodgers or get a line. Who do you have going to Green Bay at 12? DK Metcalf. And and I know you have your concerns with him, but this is what I'll say about Metcalf. All right. Um, He's – how can I explain? So you talked about production. You said, hey, you know, he couldn't beat out A.J. Brown in production. Now, in in their offense – all right, when when DK got hurt, when he hurt his, his neck, he was leading the team in yards and touchdowns. So he had more yards, he had more touchdowns. He did have like 10 less catches than A.J. Brown, but he had more yards, more touchdowns. Now, the, the issue is that Ole Miss's offense was built to go inside out. So A.J. Brown was the first read just because he's in the slot, and that's the easiest throw for the quarterback to make. So there was a lot of things where it was just like, hey, run through his zone, I'm going to hit you in the open spot. The outside receivers, both Lodge and McCaff, they ran a few routes. Five-yard stop, 10-yard stop, go route. And I think it was all predicated on how the def- defender was playing. So if he felt like he could outrun the defender on a certain play, he doesn't go. If a defender is upfield shoulder, he stops. 
and I think the quarterback just read him and they just threw it. Right. When what I watched the LSU game, he didn't run an in breaking route until one minute left in the third quarter. That that's the offensive coordinator's fault. That's not on the receiver. Right. Uh, explosive, extremely difficult to press. I mean, you you can't really press McCaff. He blows right through it with his explosiveness, his hands, and his feet. He has really good feet at the line of scrimmage. So a lot of people, they go into the cone, three cone and say, hey, he can't run routes. It's not true. Now, he might not run a double move. I might not ask him to run uh, a post corner, or I might not have him run a whip route, or I might not have him run a Dino, which is a, a corner, or which is a post corner post, right? I might not have him run anything like that. But if you're just talking about, you know, Five yard out, ten yard out, slant, dig, post, comeback, you know, uh, curl, go route, corner route. Like he can run all those, and they didn't do a lot to help him. They didn't do any tight split stuff to you know get him different matchups against zones and things like that. So I think a more wide open offense, especially with Green Bay getting a new head coach and a new offensive minded guy with somebody this explosive to pair with Devontae Adams and some of the young receivers they drafted last year, I think it would be a great situation for McCaff. And, and, and he, I think he'd go off and explode on the scene. Now, he might not be a high-volume catch guy, but if he ended up with, like, 65 catches for 1,300 yards, I wouldn't be at all surprised. And he's a great red zone weapon. He can manhandle – you know, opposing cornerbacks, so say, by just his stature. I mean, this dude right. is, he's a monster. This is like... And, and he doesn't have the best of hands. Like, so you're, you're going to get a drop here and there. But I think the trade-off with the, you know, the big plays, the big explosive plays, the yards after catch, yards after contact, I think, you know, those type of things where he was good after the catch. Um, you, the trade-off is going to be, you know, pretty good. Right. This is... I mean, this is best case scenario for him getting put with a Hall of Fame quarterback right away who can show him like, hey, you're kind of running this route a little differently than I need you to do this and maybe it'll up your game. So, I'm, I mean, look, if it happens, I'm not going to be sad about it. <laughs> that's that's not me. I'm not going to complain right. and be sad. And he'll tell him as well, hey, I know people think you have to be all technical, but you don't. You're big, you're fast, you're explosive. I just need you to get to this spot and do this, and I'll hit you on the numbers. So those are the type of things that you're going to get from a veteran quarterback. All right, just play your game. That's right. it. Just play what you're good at. I'm not going to ask you to do something you're not good at, and that'd be silly. Right. So now we go to Miami, and this is where I could see another quarterback come in because they have you know stopgap guy in Ryan Fitzpatrick here. Where do you see Miami going with this pick? Yeah, quarterback, I think they take the kid from Duke Jones. Daniel Jones. So Daniel Jones going to Miami, that would be intriguing. That would be a very, you know, fun little fun little experiment there. I'm not a big fan of Jones just because I, I didn't like his game so much and I felt like he was inconsistent in his decision making. But if he can learn from a veteran like Ryan Fitzpatrick in year one, that would go miles for him. So now we go to Atlanta, which is pick 14. They have a quarterback in Matt Ryan, so we're not going quarterback again here. We're going to go with, I think, defensive end. That's my biggest need for them. And there is a guy by the name of Montez Sweat who has concerns based on his heart condition, but doctors have pleaded and, you know, stood by their decision that it's not a big deal. Where do you think they should go? Yeah, I can see Montez Sweat. You know, they, they lost uh, Claiborne. You know, Vic Beasley hasn't just been the guy that they probably, um, you know, expected him to be. It's, you know, he had one big year, but outside of that, he's been kind of, you know, a little bit more quiet. They took Tack McKinley. Uh, you know, that, that that's cool. But, you you know, you want to have two bookend, uh, you know, edge rusher guys. So I could see them going with the Montez Sweat, uh, you know, and I think he that would be a good spot for him in that 4-3. Speaking of good spots. This is the direct middle of this draft, and Washington is sitting here with a quarterback on the board and some top receiver names. Do you think this is what they need to address? Yeah, and I think they address it by trading the number 15 pick to the Arizona Cardinals. So now the Arizona Cardinals are back on the, on the clock. Uh, the Cardinals gave them Josh Rosen. 
this is this is perfect. This would be the perfect scenario. Maybe we could finally see what Josh Doxson is. I mean, that's that's what I'm waiting for. So where do the Arizona Cardinals go with this pick now that they have moved back into the first round? Yeah, so I, I think now they, they get another receiver, right? You got Fitzgerald. He's a little bit on the, on the older side, <laughs> a lot of bit on the older side. <laughs> you do have Christian Kirk, who's a good – uh, foundation piece that's going to be around in a while. You have Williams, the kid from uh, Grambling. Uh, I want to say he's played uh, two years now, or is it one? Yeah, was he a rookie Williams. last year? Yeah, Chad, Chad Williams. Williams. I think he's. Years. I think it's been two years. So yeah, Chad Williams. And it's like, okay, that's cool. He's one of those pieces where it's like, okay, we'll see. But I think uh, we, we need to give him a guy. And this is a lot higher than I want him to go because selfishly, I really like AJ Brown. But I'm going to give. The Redskins, A.J. Brown. So you have Doxon, you have A.J. I mean, Redskins, the Cardinals. Uh, I'm going to get the Cardinals, A.J. Brown. And uh, they have Christian Kirk. They got A.J. Brown, great complimentary receiver. It's almost like when they drafted Anquan Bolden some years back. I think their skill sets are very similar. So uh, A.J. Brown to the Redskins, I mean, to the uh, Cardinals at 15. Oof, I'd have to become a Cardinals fan, man. <laughs> I mean, you got Kyler throwing to Christian Kirk and A.J. Brown, and then you have David Johnson in the backfield. That's just – that's a perfect scenario for the Cardinals. Maybe they should listen to this episode after it comes out before the draft. I don't know. If they want to fix their offense and give Cliff Kingsbury the best weapons to use, I think this is the move to make. So I'm agreeing with you here. And I might be higher on A.J. than the NFL, so we'll see. Maybe it's somebody else like uh... – Hollywood Brown, but, you know, I think, you know, just kind of complimenting uh, what they already have with Christian Kirk and kind of building off of maybe, you know, Larry Fitzgerald's, uh, uh, what his job has been and kind of adding to that, I I would say, you know, A.J. Brown kind of fits what they are, what they will need once Larry Fitzgerald leaves, which is that, that, that big body, um, you know, catch, nice catch and run, uh, do some things out of the slot, which Fitzgerald has done lately, um, but also have the ability to play outside. Right, and that's that's exactly what A.J. Brown can do. I think he can play X, Y, Z, uh, F. I mean, he can play anywhere on the field. He can play in any receiver set you need. So now back to the New York Giants. I mean, I'm sorry, back to the Carolina Panthers. Where do you see them going? Is this a, um, is this a lineman pick like Jonah Williams? Do you think they go him? Yeah, they definitely need to take off his line. I mean, this guy uh, – you know, uh, this, the Cam Newton's been getting beat up, but but they're not going to go with Jonah Williams. I think they're going to go with Dillard. Andre Dillard. Wow, that that'd be a steal. I I think he's going a little too late from what I've been hearing. He's predicted to go too late, but I, I mean that's a perfect tackle. He could play any of the tackle sides, and he has a great kick slide step. He, that's perfect, you know, with first year tackles because they have to. They have to see the difference in strength that that defensive ends bring in the NFL level, and that kick slide is very important when pass protecting. And we all know Cam likes to roll out, so he has to be quick with it. New York is back on the clock. This is their second pick. They got it in a trade from Cleveland. Where do you think they go here? Yeah, so, you know, I wanted to, you know, trade him, trade this pick with the Cardinals, but Redskins beat, beat them to it. So they're going to have to sit here and, and stay up pack. And, again, they just need to acquire talent. Uh, but there's a guy that hasn't been drafted yet, and I think he can possibly in, improve the team. And I think this is a good spot. So I'm going to go with Haskins, Dwayne Haskins. So they get the quarterback of their future. Basically, right. in my opinion, the perfect fit for their team at quarterback and if you can get him at 17 overall i mean this guy has the potential 10 years down the road to be the best quarterback from this class if kyler you know falls on his face in the nfl or if he goes play baseball haskins is that next guy in my opinion that's i mean this is just a great fit scheme wise and a great fit long term for their need right so now to the minnesota vikings uh um I'm, I'm going to have to cut now because I have to train in seven minutes. All right. Well, it's, it's all good. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a little announcement and say, you know, thank you for your time and all, all right. that.
All right. Sorry it took so long to get set up. Oh, it's all good, man. It's all good. So uh, let's see. I'm going I'm to just give you out right here. Hold on. One, two, three. All right. We're halfway through the draft, and I will personally finish the rest of this draft coming soon. I just want to give a huge thank you to Mr. Eric Crocker for coming on to the show and giving us some of his valuable time. Thank you, man. Th- thanks for having me on. Um, you know, anytime. The next time I have a little bit more time, but I really enjoy coming on right now. Just, you know, anytime I have a chance to talk f- football, you know, I'm always down. Right, right. Sometime in the future, we're going to do a San Francisco 49ers breakdown or something and have you on and, you know, just talk a whole bunch of football. Thank you again, man, for your time and all of this. I really do appreciate it. All right, man. Thank you. You have a good one. You too. All right. All right, now that Eric had to go, I'm going to finish this mock draft by myself and give you detailed explanations of why the pick is this, what is this, why, blah, 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 you know, all that good stuff. So now we're on the Minnesota Vikings, right? Minnesota Vikings, they need to take an offensive lineman. And I think the pick is Chris Lindstrom. He is a offensive guard and this guy will be able to improve the run game for Dalvin Cook help him get that top five running back season that I know he's capable of and protect in the passing game as well he's great at pulling this is great this is great next we're going to Tennessee Titans Tennessee needs defensive help but I think this is a prime spot for them to address their offensive line for the future of their franchise. So I'm going with Jonah Williams, the offensive tackle. He is somebody who can help keep Mariota healthy or the next quarterback that they draft next season whenever Mariota doesn't live up to expectations this year. Down to the Pittsburgh Steelers, who they should take is Byron Murphy. And that's who I'm going to go with here because not only does he fit the need of a number one cornerback on that team, within the next three years, he can be the guy there on defense. He can be the number one cornerback locking down any receiver. This guy can play all kinds of coverages. This is the guy that they should draft. The Seattle Seahawks are next. This will very much surprise you. Right here, they should take T.J. Hawkinson. This gives Russell Wilson a great tight end weapon that they have not had in years. Hawkinson can have a role as a blocker and a receiver here. This isn't who they will take per se, but they should take him. That way, that offense becomes unlocked to a whole nother level. T.J. Hawkinson is the pick. To the Baltimore Ravens at pick 22. I have them going to kill Harry. Now, this is not the best pick for Nikhil Harry in a fantasy sports sense. But this is a receiver who can unlock the next level of Lamar Jackson and that offense. Nikhil plays to Lamar Jackson's strengths. And he can use those strengths to make Lamar Jackson's passing accuracy look better. He is a very, very good receiver at all stages of the game. May not beat anybody with his speed, but he has the technique to be a number one in this league for a long, long time. The Houston Texans are next. Houston, man, do they have problems. One problem they can fill is their offensive line over the next three rounds. The pick here needs to be Cody Ford if he is available. He's a guard who can very much help Deshaun Watson and play to his mobility. Pick 24 is the second pick of the Oakland Raiders gold mine of first round picks. This is a pick they got from Chicago in the Khalil Mack trade. The pick here needs to be a cornerback because... The Philadelphia Eagles are right behind them. And the Indianapolis Colts are also right behind them. So if they do not take the last first-round graded quarterback here, 
cornerback year, I'm sorry, then they'll lose out on him. So DeAndre Baker is the guy that goes here. He has the best vision of any cornerback in this class. And he could be an instant contributing starter for the Oakland Raiders. At pick 25, you have the Philadelphia Eagles. No, they're not going to draft a receiver here. And they're not going to reach on a running back like Josh Jacobs. They need to get Jonathan Abram. A great safety who can play free or strong and can help be the guy after Malcolm Jenkins leaves. He is also able to play in year one and could potentially win the starting role there at the other safety position, whether it's from Rodney McLeod or whoever. Pick 26 is the Indianapolis Colts. This is intriguing because they could go so many ways with this pick. They could go numerous spots on defense. They could get Devin Bush, who would give them the best one-two boom at linebacker in the league. But I think the pick here is Marquise Brown. The Colts need a field stretcher. And I don't think anyone can stretch the field in this class like Marquise Brown. He's not necessarily one-dimensional, but this is what he does best by a long shot. So Marquise Brown is the pick here. The Oakland Raiders are up next again, the third time in this round. This is a pick they got from the Amari Cooper trade with Dallas. The pick has to be edge or offense. They could definitely get a tight end like Noah Font here, who could be an immediate red zone weapon and help Derek Carr have a very productive season. Or they could get another guy that plays edge, plays defense. They could get a guy who can be a linebacker for them like Devin Bush. But I think Gruden goes with the overhyped Josh Jacobs who I am yet to believe in because of his lack of production and because of some of the things he does wrong. I just don't see this guy being an instant solution to the running back problem of a team. But with the news today coming out of Marshawn Lynch right before the draft retiring, this is the guy that Gruden panics into picking. The Los Angeles Chargers at 28 is a very, very, very intriguing spot for all offensive linemen. It shouldn't be. The answer is very simple. You pick Dalton Risner, the offensive tackle, who can also play a little bit of guard. This guy will help keep Phillip Rivers younger than what his age is at the quarterback position. Seattle is 29. They got this pick from Kansas City. What they need to do What they need to do is draft an offensive lineman. You have the offensive piece in TJ Hawkinson. So now you take the offensive lineman. But the names here are all reaches. So the real pick should and most likely will be a cornerback. Because... Why not? This is a team that has built themselves on, hey, we're the Legion of Boom, the Legion of Doom. So they pick a guy who can play a little bit of slide corner, play free safety. This is a guy who can be an amazing addition to this team right away and fill the emptiness of Earl Thomas, and that is Deontay. Thompson, the safety out of Alabama. At pick 30, Green Bay got this pick from New Orleans. They're sitting here pretty well, having pulled in DK Metcalf with their earlier pick at pick 12. I do think that there is a big chance they go 
offense here, whether it's offensive line or not. But wow, what a steal it is to get a great player not on offense at this spot. I mean, come on, let's be serious. They should draft Irv Smith Jr. No, psych. Noah Font. If you're going to go big on athleticism and talent, why not go big at athleticism and talent at the tight end position too? So now Aaron Rodgers has a whole new bunch of offensive weapons. This is what they need to do to help him reach that ceiling that we all know he has. So Noah Font is the pick here. The Los Angeles Rams are next, second to last in this round. Do they go tight end? Do they go another spot like offensive line? No. They get Devin Bush here, who is an insane steal because he's just as good as Devin White. This is a guy who will instantly start for them and make a huge impact next to Corey Littleton in the backfield of that defense. Devin Bush is the pick to the Los Angeles Rams at 31. We've seen so many quarterbacks come off the board. So many so far. Pick number one was Kyler Murray. Pick number 10 was Drew Luck. Drew Luck. Number 13 was Daniel Jones. Number 17 was Dwayne Haskins. If you want to count Washington's pick, they traded it for Josh Rosen. So who goes to New England here? They finally, finally, after all of these years, take a quarterback. And that quarterback is Will Greer. This is a guy who can step up and take over for Brady in a few years. If he can learn from Belichick and Brady the ins and outs of the game and get the knowledge that Brady has, the sky's the limit for Will Greer. This is the pick they should make. Now, will they? The the New England Patriots are the most unpredictable team in sports. We all know that. You can't predict their backfield. You can't predict anything. So that's who I would pick. A little rundown of this mock. Arizona, Kyler Murray. San Francisco, Nick Bosa. New York Jets, Josh Allen. Oakland Raiders, Quinnen Williams. Fifth, you have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers selecting Ed Oliver. The New York Giants select Brian Burns, defensive end. Jacksonville selects offensive tackle Jawan Taylor with Detroit taking the cornerback to go across from Darius Slay. Greedy Williams. Buffalo picks the defensive lineman, Rashawn Gary. Denver gets their guy, Andrew Locke. Cincinnati is in on Devin White. Green Bay gets a phenom in DK Metcalf. And Miami gets their potential future piece at quarterback in Daniel Jones. Atlanta selects Montez Sweat. 15 is Washington's pick that they trade for Josh Rosen. The Cardinals are on the clock at 15 and take A.J. Brown. Carolina takes Andre Dillard, the tackle. 17 is the Giants, and they get their quarterback, Dwayne Haskins, instead of getting him at their earlier pick at 6. 18, Minnesota picks guard Chris Lindstrom. Tennessee picks Jonah Williams at 19 to protect Mariota. Pittsburgh gets the badass corner, Byron Murphy, who can do it all. Seattle takes TJ Hawkinson to take Russell Wilson to a new level. Now that we're speaking on new levels, that Ravens offense is on one with the pick of Nikhil Carey at pick 22. Houston takes Cody Ford. Oakland selects DeAndre Baker at 24. Philadelphia Eagles select Jonathan Abram, the safety. Indianapolis takes the top field stretcher of this class in Marquise Brown. 27 is the Oakland Raiders once again with Gruden taking Josh Jacobs to be his guy in that backfield. 
the L.A. Chargers select Dalton Risner, the tackle, to help keep Phillip Rivers from getting hurt in ending his career in a few years. Seattle gets their guy from the trade with Kansas City, where they acquired Frank Clark recently, Deontay Thompson. Green Bay gets Noah Font. This means the Green Bay offense is looking like DK, Devontae Adams, Noah Font, Geronimo Allison, Marquez Valdez, Scantling. The list goes on, people. Aaron Rodgers has weapons now. The L.A. Rams like Devin Bush to form a great duo with Corey Littleton. And New England Patriots surprise everyone and take Will Greer. The answer to their quarterback woe is coming soon. This has been The Draft Genius. You can follow me on Twitter at The Draft Genius. You can follow Eric Crocker at Eric underscore Crocker. We're both on Twitter, and all we do is talk football. I talk a little bit other sports, but that's just because, hey, I have to please everybody, right? And I love sports. Thank you to everyone who tuned in and listened. This is the Sleeper Wire Show. You can find them on Patreon at patreon.com slash sleeperwire. You can find my show, The Dynasty Wire, at patreon.com slash dynasty wire. And you can also find it on the Sleeper Wire channel or Sleeper Wire website, sleeperwire.com. As always, I'm here to bring you the great football news and words that we also need in this world. There isn't enough football in this world. I'll never be convinced there is. So now that you had this hour of fun, I hope you enjoy the NFL draft and your team takes someone you love and become a fan. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'm out. <laughs>